Thank you. Good afternoon. Is this on? Have to hold it a little bit closer. Okay, there we go. Thank you for having me uh, this afternoon and for giving up uh, your lunch break to be lectured at again. That's always fun. So the topic that I've been given today is whether or not redefining marriage will affect you. And so I'm going to, in the next sort of 20 minutes or so, systematically try to break that open. But what that means is I'm not going to explore the pros and cons or the arguments for and against the redefinition of marriage, nor am I really going to discuss the Catholic teaching on sexuality or sexual ethics more broadly, but I really want to just confine myself to considering whether or not a change in marriage law will affect the community more broadly. And in particular, I want to talk about how redefinition might affect those of us who understand marriage as being the union of a man and a woman and who will want to be able to speak about this, to live it, and to teach it to our children and grandchildren in future generations. Um, back in 2015, Senator Penny Wong and Senator Cory Bernardi had a debate about the redefinition of marriage. And in her opening remarks, Senator Wong said something really interesting. She said, if we achieve marriage equality, most things won't change. The sun will still rise. Heterosexual marriages won't crumble. Three-year-olds will still want more ice cream than is good for them, but together we would have made a profound change. And more recently, Tin and Brady, who has come over from Ireland to head up the equality campaign, um, spoke about the change in Ireland. And what he said was, all that happened is that nobody lost anything. And one small group of people in society, our lesbian and gay friends and family members were allowed to get married. And we hear that in other ways too. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard, look, if you don't agree with same-sex marriage, just don't marry somebody of the same sex. And that's it. That's about where your input ends. The idea that granting the right to marry to a group of people takes nothing away from anybody else is a popular one. And it's the reason why most people say when they're polled that they support the redefinition of marriage because they figure that it really doesn't affect their lives. And if we're honest, it's the reason that even most Catholics will say that they don't have a problem with the legal redefinition of marriage. But what, how I want to begin today is with an assertion that a change in any law has broad effects and that that is no different from the marriage law. Because laws do more than just regulate our behaviour. A speed limit of 40 kilometres an hour outside a school zone doesn't just tell you how fast you're allowed to go, it tells us that we need to take extra care in places where there are children around. So a change in law doesn't change a behaviour, it also teaches us something about our behaviour towards other groups of people, the things that we should value and everything like that. So a change in marriage law does more than expand the pool of people who might get married, it changes our understanding of marriage as a society. Currently, the law in Australia defines marriage as the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life. It means it has four key components. It's heterosexual because it's the union of a man and a woman. It's monogamous because it's to the exclusion of all others. It's voluntary and it's intended to be permanent because it, it's for life. If we were to change one of those four key factors, then our understanding of marriage across the board changes. If we were to change the law to say that marriage didn't necessarily have to be voluntary and we would allow forced marriages, marriage would become something completely different. It wouldn't be a free offering of one person to another. If we were to change marriage law to say that marriage no longer had to be exclusive and we could have polygamous marriages, then it would change marriage again more broadly across the culture. And we've seen this in, in I don't really want to call it the divorce experiment, but what's happened with divorce law. So 42 years ago, the law was changed to say that marriage didn't necessarily need to be for life. So it's still got the aspirational goal of for life in there, but with the introduction of no-fault divorce, the law came in and said that marriage doesn't necessarily have to be for life. Prior to 1975, you needed to have a reason to get divorced. You needed to prove adultery or alcohol or drug abuse or insanity or cruelty or something else. And the change in law really had good intentions because what it intended to do was take the blame and therefore the hostility out of marriage breakdown. There was no intention at the time to destroy marriage or to undermine its its nature for the rest of society. But in two generations, we've seen that the marriage law really did change the culture. Today, more than one in three marriages end in divorce. 
And while we might have the aspirational goal of marriage still being for life, we really do, don't really necessarily expect that that's going to be the case. We've got generations of children who are growing up now in a, in a culture which understands that marriage isn't necessarily for life. And what's really interesting is that the Australian Institute of Family Studies tells us that the group that is most severely affected after divorce, particularly with financial hardship, are women and children. So the very group that the change in marriage law was supposed to, have, was supposed to protect, it's ended up harming. So while I think people can disagree about whether or not changing the law on marriage, redefining it to include same-sex couples, will be a good or a bad thing for, the, for our culture, I don't really think that anyone can say that it's not going to have a broader ripple effect than just the, the immediate people involved. So with that as sort of my starting point, that there are changes, that a change in marriage law does affect other people, I want to turn specifically to the changes that we might expect the introduction of same-sex marriage. And because our time together is limited today and I want to have a decent amount of time for q and I'll only go through a handful of, of some of the consequences that I think are going to happen, and particularly ones that are relevant to uni students entering the workforce. And the first way that redefining marriage, I think, might affect you is that it might exclude someone who holds the view that marriage is between a man and a woman from certain professions. So let's take a look at some overseas experience at the moment. So Trinity Western University is a university in Canada, like I think the Australian Catholic University or UNDA just down the road. And like a lot of North American universities, most of the students live on campus. As part of the admission requirements to go into Trinity Western, students are asked to sign a community covenant, a standard of behaviour, which provides a set of biblical standards of behaviour. And it's a pretty serious list, I have to say. Not only do students agree not to steal or to cheat on exams or view pornography or take illicit drugs or anything like that, they also agree uh, no excessive drinking, which I imagine is quite hard for university students, no gossip, no lying or anything like that. And they also agree that they're not going to have sex outside of, no sexual activity outside of heterosexual marriage. Back in 2001, so before same-sex marriage was legal anywhere in the world, one of the bodies responsible for teacher accreditation, the British Columbia College of Teachers, challenged the community covenant and said that it was discriminatory against LGBTI persons. So the College of Teachers said that they would not accredit any, teacher, any teachers who came out of Trinity Western University, not on the basis of the quality of the degree or the quality of the students, but simply because they had signed the covenant and agreed to this code of conduct. And the court said at the time, the case went to court, and the court said at the time that while they recognised the potential that offence would be caused to the LGBTI community and, for that matter, to divorced persons, to de facto couples and, and others, that people were free to hold diverse views on sexuality in Canada. Let's fast forward. So, same-sex marriage was legalised in some parts of Canada in 2003 and then across the country in 2005. Since then, another group of students at Trinity Western have had their degrees not recognised by professional bodies. The, this time, the Law Society of British Columbia, in the footsteps of the College of Teachers, has refused to recognise the graduates from Trinity Western based solely on the Community Covenant. And Trinity has taken the case through numerous courts and lost every time. So if you had gotten your law degree from Trinity Western University, you would not be able to practice law in British Columbia simply because of a personal decision you made about your own sexual activity. So I just want to make clear how far the pendulum has swung. Maybe I'm a little bit sensitive because I struggled through five years of a law degree. But this is, this is where we're at right at the moment in Canada, a decade after same-sex marriage has been legalised. So if same-sex marriage is legalised in Australia, what happens to education and law graduates from places like ACU or UNDA, where the Catholic understanding of marriage is taught? Is it possible that the Law Society of New South Wales, which has publicly expressed its support of the redefinition of marriage, could similarly refuse admission to lawyers from these universities? And while it might seem outrageous, like I said, it's happening right now in Canada. Moving away from Canada to the UK, we've got the case of a man named Felix Ngoli. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. Felix is a master's student in social work. And I don't know if some of you remember the case of Kim Davis. She was the US 
um, county, county court registrar who refused to sign her name to marriage licenses after, for same-sex couples after um, same-sex marriage was legalised in the US. And so Felix, she ended up being jailed for about 12 days. And Felix just wrote on his Facebook page, I stand with Kim Davis. He was called into the university office and asked to present his student card. They confiscated it and told him that he was no longer part of the social work degree because his views did not accord with what was appropriate for social workers. So Felix is now taking his case to the High Court in the UK and they'll hear that later this year but he simply would not be, could not be admitted as a social worker because of his belief on marriage. Um, and these aren't only, this isn't only happening overseas. We can already see the appetite for it happening in Australia. At the end of last year, there were new, the federal government funded um, the putting together of some national guidelines for emergency and disaster relief. And there's a recommendation in there that says that faith-based Faith-based organisations, because of their understanding on marriage, should not be entitled to provide emergency relief in a disaster situation in Australia. And we hear submissions to various Senate inquiries and other things like that, and from other human rights groups, calling on the charitable status of um, faith-based institutions to be removed simply because of their position on same-sex marriage, not because of the charity, charitable work that they do, um, but simply because of their position on same-sex marriage. Um, and it's not only organisations that are being targeted, but also individuals. I don't know if any of you heard of the case of Mark Allaby. So Mr Allaby was, a, about two years ago, an employee, a senior executive at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And he was also on the board voluntarily of the Australian Christian Lobby. Um, he was the target of a social media campaign which suggested that a... An organisation like PricewaterhouseCoopers, which embraces diversity and I think is actually the LGBTI employer of choice, should not have somebody on their staff who was also part of the board of the Australian Christian Lobby. So he ended up being made to step down from the, the board of the ACL and then ended up having to leave PwC altogether. Fast forward two years and Mr Allaby is now at IBM and he's also on the board of something or was also on the board of something called the Lachlan Macquarie Institute which is an institute that runs sort of traineeships and internships for young Christian students who are interested in politics. Again, a social media campaign ensued and he had to step down from the board of the Lachlan Macquarie Institute. What was really interesting and almost alarming is that when IBM was approached by reporters and asked whether or not an employee of IBM was free to engage with external organisations, including faith-based organisations, outside of their employment, IBM refused to answer. Not long ago, that question would have been a no-brainer. And of course, of course they're, they're free to, to engage with faith-based organisations outside of their employment. Not anymore. Recently, a Telstra employee um, had written into the paper saying that she had declined an invitation to participate in the company-wide Wear It Purple Day. So they all got one of those calendar invites to Wear It Purple on a particular day, and she declined it she was sent the invitation an additional six times by her senior manager until she complied. So what I hope to illustrate by this handful of examples is that as you move from university into your professional lives, the redefinition of marriage isn't necessarily going to mean, mean living and letting live. It's going to be about more than that and you might actually find, encounter some of this in your own professional careers. Moving on from career and professional life for the moment, I next want to talk about what the redefinition of marriage might mean for the education of our future generations, the education of your kids and your grandkids. And I know you had a talk on safe schools yesterday and I don't know what Mr Tudhope said, and I, but I don't necessarily want to repeat it. What I will say more and more is that in countries where marriage has be, been redefined, what we're seeing is a mandatory requirement for schools to present same-sex marriages on an equal footing to opposite sex marriages, even in faith-based schools. So, so programs like safe schools now become mandatory across the board. Again, we're seeing this most clearly in Canada, which has had same-sex marriage for more than 10 years now. But we're also seeing it in the UK just a little bit more recently. And now, while the Catholic understanding of marriage might not be everyone's favourite church teaching, and I addressed a number of Catholic school teachers last night, and I can tell you it wasn't there amongst their favourites, but I think we run into some problems if the state is allowed to restrict or dictate the way in which Catholic schools are allowed to teach their faith. 
get into some really dangerous territory. A Catholic school is a Catholic school because it is able to pass on the Catholic faith. And we have a real battle on our hands in keeping the identity of a school as Catholic if, we're not, if the state gets to dictate how we teach our Catholicism. But Catholic school identity isn't, isn't important in and of itself. It's important because Catholic education is a ministry to parents and to, and to students. It's a recognised human right, both under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Australia's a signatory to both, that parents have a right to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in accordance with their own beliefs. That's why we have Catholic schools, and that's why the state supports having faith-based schools, because it's the, the way that the state allows people to exercise that right that they've guaranteed. And so when the identity of schools is interfered with, we're imposing on the ability of parents to raise their children in the faith. But in Canada, going back to Canada, what happened as soon as same-sex marriage is redefined, the Ontario High Court, um, or Supreme Court I think it was, invented a right for children to see their family structures reflected in their education. And so they started to introduce, like in a safe school context, they started to introduce LGBTI themes even sort of in picture books for kindergarten kids. And then a group of parents took the matter to court, objecting specifically to these picture books for, for the um, preschoolers and, and kindergarten kids and said, look, some of this material is just not age appropriate. To which the court responded, tolerance is always age appropriate. In the years that, since that has happened, the content has become much more specific, much more detailed, much greater than the birds and the bees. It's more the birds and the birds, the birds and the bees, the bees and the bees, and everything in between. It's complex and it's detailed and it's compulsory even for Catholic schools. And over the past few years, parents have unsuccessfully tried to challenge the introduction of this. Um, towards the end of last year, a case concluded there was a father named Steve Torlukas and he had a couple of kids in primary school and he went to the school and said, look, what I would like to do is I would like you to exclude my children from any class where you're presenting homosexual activity as being morally acceptable. Contrast to my Greek Orthodox faith, and so I would just like my children to be able to step out of those classes. They said to them, him they couldn't for two reasons. One, because presenting homosexual activity as normal was something that was embedded across the entire school curriculum and not in individual classes. So there was, it was actually impossible for them to take the kids out because they would be taking them out of school altogether. And also they said that it was a form of bullying to have children excluded from the class because then other students would wonder why and it would make them think that there was something wrong with homosexuality. So he went to court as well and, and sort of tried to, get the, tried to force the school's hand and the court said that they understood that it was a big imposition on the religious freedom of Mr. Tualukas and on his right to raise his children in the faith, but they said that they didn't care that the values of equality and tolerance overran now the parents' right. So again, this isn't about a live and let live mentality. Um, if we go over into the UK, um, at the beginning of this year, the top advisor on community integration, so the UK has obviously had a lot of immigration um, over the last few years, the, top the government's top advisor on community integration said that it's not okay for Catholic schools to teach that marriage is between a man and a woman because that's not how we raise children anymore. Um, and just a few weeks ago, the UK Teachers Union voted in favour of LGBTI issues coming into schools from preschool up and with no exception for faith-based schools. Again, this isn't just a, this is what's happening overseas, we're seeing the appetite here in Australia. Um, you might all remember the famous or the infamous Don't Mess With Marriage booklet from the Australian Catholic Bishops a couple of years ago. Um, and what happened was that all of the Australian bishops, not just Archbishop Porteous, but all of the Australian bishops were told that they had a case to answer before the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commission. And the reason that the case was brought in Tasmania is because it has the widest anti-discrimination laws in the country. And also the National Director of Australian Marriage Equality at the time, Rodney Croom, actually issued a media release calling on his supporters, calling on the supporters to make a complaint against the Catholic bishops in Tasmania. So the complaint ended up being made by an activist who had no connection to a Catholic parish or to a Catholic school and actually had to look for a copy of the booklet on the internet, download it in order to be offended by it and then make a complaint about it. But 
I'm, I'm not intending to be funny, what I'm showing is that there is a real appetite here for the targeting of Catholic schools and the Catholic Church in the way that they teach their flock. We're already seeing, we're already seeing it, and it will only increase. We'll, the use of anti-discrimination laws as a weapon will only increase if marriage is redefined. And I think that, that we've seen this most clearly in responses to the recent Senate Select Committee inquiry into the exposure draft of same-sex marriage legislation. So I don't know if you know, but towards the end of last year, the government said, okay, if we were going to redefine marriage, here's some draft legislation and we want your comments on it. And everybody was invited to put in a submission about what they thought and particularly about the protections for religious freedom in, in the bill. And a group called Just Equal in, um, in conjunction with parents and friends of lesbian and gays, PFLAG, commissioned the biggest survey of LGBTI Australians that's ever been conducted and asked them about the religious protections in this bill. I'm going to read you some of the statistics. So in, a, in the survey, a number of scenarios were posed. They were asked about whether or not minister of re, ministers of religion should be allowed to refuse to marry a same-sex couple, whether military chaplains, civil celebrants, employees of births, deaths and marriages, and private businesses, we've all heard, the, the bakers, the florists and everything like that, whether or not those who provide services to the wedding industry should be allowed to decline to be involved in the same-sex wedding. The results were staggering. So for ministers of religion, 59% of LGBTI Australians said no, there should be no exemption for ministers of religion to marry a same-sex couple. And, and that was really the only occupation where the LGBTI community felt that there could maybe be some compromise. In every other scenario, more than 90% responded that there should be absolutely no protections at all. More than half of the LGBTI community think that a minister of religion should not be exempt from celebrating a same-sex marriage. And more than 90% believe, for example, that if a Christian school hires out its chapel for weddings of former students, that it should also be made to let that be used for a same-sex wedding. What was also really interesting was that a number of the people who said that they would accept legislation with protections for religious freedom in it did so on the basis that they believed that in the future those protections would be removed anyway. So they said, we might, well, we might as well let it through with protections now and then we'll work towards having them removed from legislation going forward. Indeed, um, opposition leader Bill Shorten has said that if, if same-sex marriage becomes legal under, under a coalition government and there are religious freedom protections within that legislation, that the future Labor government will repeal them. So again, this isn't, this isn't an academic exercise, this is real life. So it's about more than the bakers and the florists and the photographers, although they're important. Sorry, Geo. <laughs> um, and I haven't, I didn't really want to go into some of those cases from overseas. I'm sure a lot of you have heard them, the bakeries that have had to shut down and everything like that. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about them in Q&A if you like. Um, but I guess what I want to say about that is in a civil society, should someone really be forced to do something that is against their faith or against their conscience? Should a Muslim printer really be forced to print an image of the Prophet Muhammad when they know that, when we know that that's against the Islamic faith to do that? Should the fashion designers who objected, who have said that they won't dress First Lady Melania Trump, should they be forced to do so? Should a homosexual baker be forced to decorate a cake which had a quote from Leviticus on it? Should people really be required to use their creative gifts, gifts and talents to promote a message for, to which they disagree? I think that we can do better for everybody than that, not just for people of faith. And then just finally, I want to give just one more example about how the redefinition of marriage might affect future generations. Back to Canada, Canada again, sorry. It's, I'm using Canada just because it's not the, in the only in the USA pile. It's close to us in terms of its legal system, pretty much its culture as well. The end of last year, something called the All Families Are Equal Act was passed. And what that, what that legislation had the effect of doing is it stripped the words mother and father out of every piece of legislation. So it removed the words mother and father and replaced it with parent. In Canada now, you can have your birth certificates list up to four parents on them and it's got nothing to do with biology. The, the parents on the birth certificate 
are there on the basis of the contractual arrangement between those four people at a time. So a birth certificate has gone from something which is the, primar the primary identification document for a child to a record of a relationship between a number of consenting adults. Um, our generation has grown up with a lot of either ourselves or our friends coming from families where there's been marriage breakdown and we've seen the effects of sort of custodial arrangements and things like that on, on kids having to spend, you know, every second weekend with dad or something like that. What happens to kids in a future generation where they're actually four people with equal claim on, on the rights to the child. Um, I suggest that this does little for children and really little for equality. Goodness, there are so many more examples that I could give you, but I, I think I'll leave it there and we'll enter into Q&A. I just want to finish on a final point, which is to say that it's really tempting to think that none of this will affect us or affect anybody else. And it's really tempting to, to really want to be people who live and let live. Um, but a redefinition of marriage really will affect everybody. And so it means that we have a choice to make. We can either be interested and engaged in this issue and participate in this ongoing discussion we're having in Australia as it continues to unfold, or we can sit back. But I think that if we sit back, we're probably going to end up like Canada. Um, that's all I have. I'll take your questions.